Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I will, will apologise up front that I might have to take the load off sometimes. So the chair's been put here in case I need to sit down because I've got two, another human to carry along here. So I apologise for that up front. Um, but thank you everybody for having me here today, those in the room and those that are joining us virtually. Um, I feel very honoured to stand here today to talk to you about the journey that we've been on and continue to go on in terms of our consumer closeness programme that we launched at Reckitt. So a bit about what we will cover today. Um, so first of all, I'll set up a context, so the, the why around why we had to look at a consumer closeness programme. I'll then move on to the how, so what we did and continue to do. And then lastly, I'll leave you with some thoughts in terms of where are we now, what are we exploring next, as well as some key parting insights that I'll give you in terms of if you're thinking of going on the journey yourself, what are the sort of key insights that I would ask you to consider as you do that. So a bit of the context. Um, so the challenge that we were faced with is every year we have a Glint survey, which is our inter internal employee survey that goes out. And one of the key uh, metrics that we have is um, Reckitt listens to consumers to better serve and enhance their lives. So Reckitt UK hygiene, we were sitting at 58%. Unfortunately, this was a massive 23% lower than the global average, which obviously came as a massive shock to us as a business. We were like, especially me as the heading up the insights and analytics department, it's not something that you wanted to see or um, experience, as well as we were conscious this was the biggest gap we saw in terms of the biggest um, discrepancy to the global averages. So this was the, the sort of key focus as a business. But who does it belong to? Who does the onus of this belong to? And I think this sums it up in terms of everybody kind of like, oh, who should you know, own this consumer closeness program? Um, and we're quite a small insights team at the hygiene department in the UK. There's sort of two of us. So we, we were conscious, you know, we cannot own this as a program ourselves on top of our day jobs. But also we wanted to empower our employees to really understand consumers, get closer to consumers, and learn how they integrate that into their daily lives. So the, in terms of going on the journey, we really wanted to move employees from feeling disconnected from consumers to putting consumers first. So we decided to use a framework within the business called ACT. Um, so we really had to acknowledge where we are. So we really deep dived into, you know, where are we now, what are the problems, what are the solutions we could to, to look at. Collaboration was key, obviously, on where we wanted to go, and I'll go on to how we decided to set up our Consumer Closeness Task Force and take one step forward at a time. So we, we're conscious we're on that journey all the time. We'll learn, adapt as we go, and change things as we go, but it is a sort of one step at a time journey that we will go on. And the sort of consciousness of getting closer to consumers, as well as collaboration across the business, really sits at the heart of the record compass. So we went through a bit of a rebrand earlier this year. We were called RB, Record Benkiza. We are now rebranded back to our core, which is Record. Um, and we relaunched our compass. And, you know, the core, there's sort of four key elements of our compass. It's putting consumers and people first, seeking out new opportunities, striving for excellence, building shared success, and at the heart of that is doing the right thing always. So keeping this vision in mind, we wanted to set ourselves a vision as a consumer closeness task force. So we wanted to go from feeling very disconnected from consumers and not understanding how we can help them to enhance their lives, to having access to the resources and knowledge of consumers, customers and shoppers, to be able to make decisions to put consumers and people first by striving to do the right thing always. So that was the vision that we set out. So the journey that we went on, the Consumer Closest Task Force was led by the Insights team, two of us. We had a sponsor, our marketing director as a sponsor, as a sort of exec sponsor. Um, and what we did was we sent out a call to action to all our employees across the whole of the hygiene business to say, we need you. We need you to step forward and be our consumer heroes. And we had 14 consumer heroes step forward. 
Um, and they range from sales, trade, marketing, supply, consumer relations. So a broad range of expertise, which was integral for us to understand those touch points across the business work that we needed to focus on. We did a lot of brainstorming, <laughs> thinking, adapting, and we came up with sort of four core work streams to work on from the beginning, conscious that we couldn't do everything at the start. So what were the sort of four core things that we needed to talk to, to develop? And that's what I'll talk about today. So the what we did and continue to do, so this is the sort of the how we did it. So as I mentioned, there were sort of four core work streams that were developed. Um, at Reckitt, we love an acronym. So the first one has an acronym, our CLT, or our consumer listening team. Um, and this had sort of three key aspects that we, we built in it. Our consumer relations core listening. This is a work in progress because we were throwing COVID in the middle. So we were like, we we're ready to go to call centers and talk to consumers and um, listen to our call center colleagues talking to consumers and hear firsthand the challenges as well as hear those experiences from our employees and colleagues themselves. Um, we, we're figuring out the logistics of how we do that at the moment. Um, consumer relations data access. Um, so the consumer relations team have a, a multitude of complaints, inquiries and contacts with consumers that just sits, that was just sitting in a database. So we're like, how do we bring this to life for employees that's such rich data? And social listening. I'll, I will go into these in more detail. Um, cross department culture change. So instituting that sort of consumers king mindset across mul uh, multiple touch points across the business as well as we built some sort of key extra additional things that we thought would be really beneficial to the business. Consumer community, um, so I'll talk about we partner with an agency to build probably our biggest launch this year. We launched in February, March this year. Um, it's called Home Clean Home because we are obviously the hygiene business and it gives us a, an acronym too as record. It's HCH, we call it internally. Um, and Lighthouse, so Lighthouse is a really interesting process that we went on which was um, about in sort of December last year, we start to plan for our 2022 plans. So that's sort of 2020 planning for 2022. They were called our brand audit days, which you can imagine is hugely inspiring for <laughs> employees going into a brand audit day. Um, so we really wanted to have that external lens and hence we had the lighthouse name that came out of that. So our consumer listening team, um, as I mentioned, we had a sort of multiple, I apologize for some of the formatting, it seems to have gone a bit wrong, but um, we had this multitude of insights from consumer complaints, consumer connects, and call listening that came in, but it just sat there without any sort of um, further action that we could use on the back of it. So we used Power BI, which is a sort of online system. Um, fed all our data into that, <coughs> and also fed in our sales data. And we now have a fully interactive real-time portal that all consumers have access, uh, sorry, all employees have access to. So they can go on there, they can cut the data how they want by different brands, different countries, et cetera, and really understand what are the sort of key things that are driving their brands or issues that are driving their brands at that time. Um, we also created bespoke reports so we had power brand reports that um, sit across our sort of key brands within the business. They really look at a global level. What are the sort of things we're hearing from consumers? This is done monthly. Um, and what are the sort of key things that we need to work on as well as what are we hearing in terms of who's contacting us? What are the issues they're contact, uh, contacting us about, etc. We also did exec summary reports that are more designed to be at a country level. So across the different countries, what are we hearing and what do we need to focus on? And social listening, we partnered with one of the sort of our sponsors today is Brandwatch. So we've built a sort of global partnership with Brandwatch um, and we've brought to life kind of those, the finger on the pulse in terms of the contact with consumers real time, listening to what they're saying about our brands, but most importantly also about competitive brands. So what do we need to be thinking about? <coughs> So cross department culture change, as I said, it's all about sort of instituting that consumer's king mindset. Um, so we had, um, again, sorry about the 
formatting, it's all gone a bit funny. Um, we had uh, a look across our sort of operating model and where those sort of consumer closeness touch points we needed to institute, whether that be in reporting, key forums, etc. So that was part of the process overall. But there were also two key initiatives that we did. One of them was learning cafes. So we branded them, had a little sort of branding exercise that we went on. Um, and this was really designed to be sort of 30 to 45 minutes ad hoc learning discussions where people could go have a coffee, learn something new, very informal. Um, and what we did was we ha obviously have a multitude of partners that we work with, um, whether that be Ipsos or Mintel or Zeal Creatives, BrandMe, etc. Um, and we, we invited them to come talk to our employees about a, top of it, a topic of interest. So it wasn't about them coming to do a creds presentation, which is really important. It was about more, um, we want you to inspire our employees, give them something new, let them learn some, something new about um, consumers or e-com or whatever was going on. We launched these in about February this year. We've had 10 sessions to date, so we have one or two a month. Um, we've got three to go in 2021, um, and we've had about 600, approximately 600 people live listen to the sessions. So they've been hugely successful, um, and we will continue them into next year. New joiners, that's his induction underneath there, is um, we were conscious that it was really key that we um, brought to life our brands to either people joining the company or people moving brands within the company. Um, and it was all a bit ad hoc how that happened. It was usually, you know, manager imparting that information, but there was no one central part, part that we had these decks that explained the brands, whether that be from a marketing perspective, trade perspective, P&L, et cetera. So what we did is we built these decks. They now sit on our internal employee website, Ruby, um, and it's become part of a mandatory module that new joiners have to complete when they join. So it's really instituted within the culture and the business. So consumer community, I'll, I'll play a bit of a video to introduce it and then I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Clean Home is a really exciting opportunity for RB to re-engage with consumers and really bring consumer to the heart of everything that we do. When is the last time you have ever spoken to a consumer? Or when is the last time you sales checked an idea with a consumer before getting into 4P details or financial details or the business cases? Most of the time, the response to that question is, well, I don't know, or I don't know how to connect to a consumer very easily as well. Hi everyone, um, I'm super excited about the Home Clean Community launch. Those of you that know me will know that I feel that growth comes from us understanding our consumers and our shop emissions better. Every time I have an opportunity to attend a focus group, uh, in-home visit, a one-on-one -on -one interview or a shop along, I feel that I learn more about our growth opportunities, more about the gaps and problems we need to solve to help our consumers in their everyday life. One thing I'm really looking forward to as part of the new community is going to be access to consumers on a regular basis to really pressure test our ideas and hypotheses. I think having consumer feedback on these things really helps us externalise them with our retail partners with more clout and hopefully will drive better engagement. Can't wait to see it.
as I said, probably the biggest launch we had this year, a lot of investment behind it, but you could see the engagement that we had behind key people across the business, which was really key for us. Um, it was really designed as a sort of dedicated online resource to give employees access to consumers at any time that they wanted. Um, we partnered with a company, we did a sort of tender out to different agencies and we partnered with a company called Insights, who's our, our key agency that we work on in the community. Um, we've got 3,000 members that sit on there. Um, you saw about the sort of the lounge that we have where consumers can go on and generate their own conversations. To date we've had 80 of those user generated content, which is great. Um, 66 activities since launch, which has been a massive success. So bearing in mind we've only been operational on it since sort of February, March this year. So there's been a wealth of activity going on on there. Um, and DIY projects, so this is how we wanted to democratize, democratize the insights for all employees. So um, all employees, whether you have an insight background or not, can go on there and get access to um, off-the-shelf platforms that are easy for them to to initiate. So this is just talking about what do we have on the platform itself. So essentially what we wanted to ensure is that we get insights to drive that consumer centricity and culture change. Um, we've got two different sort of ways that we can do that. Complex and creative ad hoc projects. Those are driven by the insight teams really. So if, if the question that we have that gets generated from either strategy sessions or um, our key stakeholders come to us and we're like, that's quite complex and complicated. We'll partner with you, go on that journey and create that project with insights to, to do that, make sure it goes right. Then we've got our templated projects, which are on the platform themselves. Um, employees can go on there. They cover at the moment ideas and claim screening, pack evaluation, quick dip price testing, store visits, MPD and product feedback. So these are really designed to say um, the tools are on there, you can go in there, choose what you want, and how we allow that to happen is across those categories that you saw that we have, whether it be laundry, um, automatic dishwash, etc. we have a um, key employee who's known as a sort of advocate for that area. They get given a budget, they hold that budget, um, and they kind of will have people coming to them and saying, I really want to do this, this initiative. Um, do we have budget to do that? Do you think it's the right thing to do? And they sort of hold the, the sort of um, onus on, on keeping that going alive, but also making sure that it's not just all coming back to insights department themselves. Because uh, as you can imagine, if we had to run all these projects, it would be too much for us to be able to do. This is a snapshot of what one of the pages of our community looks like. So it's designed to be very user friendly. All employees have access to it, so you can log on, have a look at what consumers are saying. We load up all the projects that are done so people can search there and have a look at what's been done in the past. Um, super user-friendly, as I say, and it's um, open to all internally. So this is just a, to bring to life how engaged our home clean homers are. <laughs> so they really love it. I mean, people are obsessed with cleaning, who knew? Um, but there's, there's some great conversations that happen there. Happen on there, um, And this is it's a bit long, but I wanted to give you the gist of what this was. Um, is, this is a, one of our internal stakeholders who did a qualitative and quantitative piece of work on the community to understand if this innovation we wanted to launch was um, going to work, essentially. Um, and she talks about Cassie and Lucy. And we've got Cassie, Lucy and Mao that sit at Insights as our sort of agency partner. And I think one learning I would say is a key thing if you're going on this journey is really embedding those agency partners within the business. So um, we see them as an extension of our inside team essentially. They come to sort of st key strategy meetings, key debriefs, etc. So they really get to know the business as well as our brands. So when they come to doing projects, they know essentially a lot about the brands and the business and therefore what will work best in terms of how we design our methodology, our sample, how we debrief, etc. So that I think has been a key finding is that extension of your agency as a part of your insight team. 
Um, so we've been going on discussions at, at sort of EU A and Z level in terms of how can we bring scale to home clean home because we've, we've seen the massive, massive success it has in the UK. Um, we are obviously in discussions with our sort of inside colleagues across EU A and Z, but there could be a lot of benefit across the business if we were to scale HCH as a sort of wreck it consumer community. So that's an ongoing discussion that we have. So Lighthouse, I'll introduce Lighthouse with a video also so you can get to know a bit about what this Lighthouse process was all about. <laughs> As a business, we want to be more external facing. With this challenge in mind, we redesigned and rebranded our brand audit days to Lighthouse 2022. The Lighthouse name and icon was chosen as a symbol for scanning the external environment, allowing us to bring the outside world in. We had four key objectives for pre plan 2022. Number one, scanning the external environment. Number two, putting the consumer and shopper at the heart. Number three, unleashing cross-functional and agency collaboration. And number four, creating proper thinking time. The energy, focus and passion of everyone involved in Lighthouse 2022 has been impressive and the process an incredible success. We'd love to tell you more. of Lighthouse was to really challenge our thinking on growth opportunities and issues. So with this in mind, we sought to get the very best out of RB's own internal knowledge, as well as deliberately sourcing provocative external perspectives to stretch thinking. We worked with RB's own internal teams, as well as agency partners, to curate stimulus on macro trends, on what was going on with consumers, and the key shopper trends we needed to be on top of. In the week before the workshop, teams digested and actively reflected on this stimulus, adding implications for growth opportunities and issues to the collaboration platform Neural, before the live sessions even began. And this meant that teams were prepared for success and was immensely powerful. In the virtual workshop, we then focused our live time on inspiration and provocation sessions, including macro trends with GDR. Well, that's interesting, you don't see that very often where the inner lining gets returned for refills global and local category strategy discussion and Q&A, live consumer focus groups based on questions that teams submitted as part of their pre-work. The thing that struck me um, was just how many different air care products they were using. I don't know where all of this laundry comes from. There's only two of us. I have to agree with Jenny there. I didn't have to um, shop online at all until the first lockdown. Whatever makes it easier, I'll use that. Live retailer Q&As. Uh, as you see, there's lots of people on the call uh, eager to, uh, to hear from you. They uh, just can't fulfill the demand of the customers. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. You've got the job. <laughs> yes. And that's really where we're seeing, seeing the growth from. And finally, Neil, some perspectives on growth opportunities. So this meant the live sessions were full of inspiration, discussion, debate, and alignment on opportunities and issues, along with knowledge gaps and portfolio gaps. And the journey did not stop there. Teams then moved on to align on strategic objectives, jobs to be done, and how they would be delivered, all in preparation to present to the management team.
hopefully that brought it to life for you. I'm conscious of time, so um, I, won't, I won't sort of go through this in detail. But that was, um, we essentially, we had the problem of the pandemic thrown our way. So we couldn't do this face to face, which was unfortunate. Um, but we had a partner of an agency called Paraffin, um, who we did all our online content creation and our workshopping with, and they were fantastic. Um, we also used Mural, as they mentioned, so all our sort of key opportunities, portfolio gaps, jobs to be done, etc., were all loaded on there. So we had access to them at all times and could go away as teams to explore those in detail. Um, and this just is an outline of what was in the video, but sort of the key inputs that we had were macro trends, the local and global category strategy, which is incredibly important, consumer scan shop and retailer scan, and our growth opportunities. And as I said, you know, there's, there's the three key things we came out at the end were your growth opportunities and issues, knowledge gaps, and portfolio gaps. And those were across our key categories, which then helped go on to develop our 2022 plans. So where are we now and what's next? So, sorry, formatting. We know we were in June 2020. Not where we wanted to be, 58% minus 23%. I like to kind of put that away because it's not the best thing to see. We went back to our employees a year later, so June this year. Um, and I'm pleased to say we had a massive 21% um, gain in terms of that metric, um, which was a fantastic success for us. So, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what are we exploring next? Consumer Connects, so at a qualitative conference, I can't, you know, not talk about qualitative things, but we're conscious we've been through a pandemic. We haven't had that consumer closeness that we wanted. Um, so in-home visits, you know, shop-alongs, etc. So it's definitely something that we want to immerse ourselves in the physical reality of consumers' lives. So that's going to be a focus of next year. Lighthouse 2023, so we're just going through the process of planning that. You know, what can we keep, tweak, and consider for next year? So that is what we're going through at the moment. Home Clean Home 2.0, so how do we embed it even more, but also exploring those new methodologies, especially those qualitative ones, which we really feel is lacking at the moment. End to end, so as a company, we're really going through a sort of pulling out our end to end process. Um, to really make sure that there's no disconnects between what we do from sort of initiating things to, to launching. Um, so consumer insights is a key part of that and where we make sure that fits within the process. And consumer closeness best in class across EU ANZ. So because we were the sort of pioneers as a country in the UK of consumer closeness program, we've been tasked as, you know, be the pioneers of the best in class methodologies and things that we can do, and how do we impart that knowledge onto our EU ANZ partners? Oh, it's, the formatting has gone very wrong again. Um, so, in terms of finishing up and leaving with you my key thoughts on um, if you're going on a journey like this or considering it yourselves, I think, I think the overarching theme is it's a journey, it's not a destination. We're on that journey. We, we know we'll never sort of get to an end point. We have to keep learning and adapting and changing. Ensuring top-down engagement is key for resource involvement. So obviously we had some big initiatives that we needed budget for. We needed buy-in for people to join our task force, etc. So having that engagement atop, across the levels from top-down is really important. Keep up the excitement, don't let stagnancy, sit, stagnancy sit, set in. So that's really key. And I think we're at a really good point now that we need to have a look at what we're doing and how do we reinvigorate things. Um, set yourself up for success to give your permission to, yourself permission to fail to do so. So there were a lot of things we explored. We had to kind of let them go because we knew they weren't going to work for various reasons. So having that sort of mindset that sometimes things will work, sometimes they won't, is really important. So I've talked about this sort of end-to-end -end model approach. So the relevancy of touch points across the operating model is really key um, to ensure that buy-in from the business, from the top down, especially with the exec. If you're doing a lot of things that are ad hoc and not relevant to the business, you're not going to get that buy-in. And that cross-functional collaboration is key. So if we were a sort of two-person insight team driving all the initiatives ourselves, it would 
you know, it wouldn't work. We needed to understand across the different functions what would work with them, what wouldn't work with them, but also ensure they became advocates of consumer closeness across the business. Thank you, or you, as it says. <laughs> Questions? Over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, sorry, I have a question regarding the um, consumer community that you set up. Uh, actually, two questions. The first is uh, about the animation or, let's say, the management of the community. How much of this do you outsource to your agency? How much do you do yourself, considering that you're a small team? And the second question was about the DIY. Did you start with that immediately or did you have to train the organization before giving them access to go to consumers directly? Sure. So on your first point, um, a lot of our community is managed by our agency. But as, as I said, a sort of key part of that is making sure that they are embedded within our company as almost an extension of the insights team. So we've built that relationship. We've built that knowledge with them. So for example, if we find that we are fully inundated, we cannot handle any more um, requests, but we know that the requests that come in is quite, it's quite a sort of easy one for them to deal with. We'll put them directly in charge with, you know, running that, but they run sort of all the background, the framework, the content, etc. cetera. Um, the second question, remind me, sorry. The DIY. DIY, yes, launched at the same time. So all launched together because that was the whole sort of democratizing the insight to everyone. Um, we had to kind of think about what were the core DIY um, methodologies we wanted to launch. So what were relevant because they were, uh, we were presented with sort of 20 or 30 odd that we could do. <laughs> so we had to think about, okay, within the business, what are the first sort of six that we think would be the, the most relevant and we can adapt those as we go. So part of our sort of HCH 2.0 is thinking about are those still relevant, or do we want to add more or change some of those? Wasn't there another question over there? Yeah. Hi, um, I must have missed it, uh, or maybe I missed it because I was a little late for the for, the, for this uh, presentation, unfortunately. But I was just wondering, what was the situation at Record before you launched this program? Um, because I'm guessing that you've been using uh, panels and um, research for an extended period of time. Um, so what, in what sense did you democratize this? Who was let in on this, these insights that were not in the loop before? Mm. Yeah, and I think the reality is that um, we've got quite lean teams at Reckitt in terms of you know, the insight team, the marketing teams, etc. Um, so everybody's going at sort of 100 miles an hour all the time. Um, so I think that sort of that closeness aspect in terms of consumers not feeling um, employees not feeling close to consumers also came from a fact of um, I don't have time to fit that into my life. Um, so that was what was really important for us to do was to make sure whatever we did fitted into what they do and didn't become an extra task for them to be able to do that. So that was our whole sort of making sure that whatever we built initiated, implemented, um, what we looked cross-functionally about what would work, what wouldn't work, um, and what would make their lives enriching, but it also in an easy way. Hi, um, I've got a kind of digital face-to-face -face question for you. Um, Obviously, a lot of your tools and techniques have been really, really good at sort of finding consumer insight, and you've done a very good job at embedding them. Um, and that's been through long-term communities or social listening or other tools like that. Why do you need a consumer closeness program next year? Why do you need to go into people's homes? What are you missing that you want to get from that? From that face-to-face -face aspect? Yeah. Um, I think it's... There's also a bit of a disconnect, I think, with employees. So what we watched, we saw, um, and I'm on the, on the panel tomorrow talking about you know, engaging with face-to-face -face research, but um, what we're seeing a bit with employees is that um, with online focus groups, for example, there's been huge dropout rates. So it's almost become, instead of an essential, I need to go to that focus group, it's, oh, it's a nice to have, oh, actually I've had a meeting go and I'm not gonna go attend. 
So we really want to make sure that employees realize how beneficial that is, listening face-to-face -to, -face to consumers, and there will still be a balance of digital versus in the home, but that, that real richness is really missed by not having that face-to-face -face contact, contact with consumers. So immersing yourselves in the homes themselves, going on a shopping trip with them to see what is the reality of their lives, what are the challenges that they face. Um, so we, we still will balance that, but I think that, that richness is what we want to bring back from that face-to-face. Um, when you democratize insights, how do you make sure different stakeholders' takeaways and actions are aligned? Yeah, so that's, that's the sort of, um, that's why we have those sort of advocates or cons those employee advocates that sit across the different categories that are almost the, the portal for employees doing the research themselves. So it's not that we would any employee can go on there, spend our money, and do whatever they want. There is a sort of a gatekeeping process to understand, okay, what is your question? Actually, sometimes it's come up like, we've got lots of research, we don't need to do anything else. If it's validated and we need to do it, we kind of look at our budgets across the different categories that we're working on and um, understand, you know, what's the best way to do the research um, and do we have the money to support it. Thank you. I, I just wanted to just uh, add a point and then ask you a question. So the, going in home and doing observational stuff reveals things that people would never be able to tell you, right? So it's really, really important, much better than asking questions and filtering answers that kind of um, give you a certain type of understanding and information, but n not really good for discovery. But what I wanted to ask you was, has anything failed, anything not worked as part of your consumer closeness program? Anything bombed? Yeah, so one thing that we've been trying to get off the ground that hasn't worked as yet was we wanted to um, do sampling, um, whether that be with consumers or employees, um, and that's not just our products, but competitive products too. So have that sort of closeness from a both consumer and employee angle of our products themselves, how consumers use them, how should employees be using them, etc. So far, we haven't been able to get that off the ground. It's, it's quite a costly process, as you can imagine, to be able to send out products to, to a wide range of people. The pandemic was thrown in the middle of it, so there was nobody in the office. Um, so that's something that, that did fail for us. Um, uh, the sort of consumer listening team, I did mention it. We wanted to kind of have that, those consumer relations sessions directly with consumer relations people. Um, at the moment, we, we're finding that's not possible. So that's also something that's failed. Um, those are, I would say, are the two sort of big ones that we've, we've tackled as fail failures. <laughs> Hi, um, Ferdy Simon, Discover AI. Um, I'm, I'm curious from a sort of, uh, you know, as a, as a record consumer myself, what, what some of the more kind of problematic um, issues or kind of categories were that kind of stood in the way of, of, the, of this kind of closeness to the brands or brand? Sorry, can you just go into Sorry, that? if you yes. could, I mean, just like, you know, um, what were some of the kind of key uh, issues that could kind of shed light on this like what what were what were some of the problematic things that kind of stood in the way of of that closeness of with between uh, for consumers? employees basically yeah. well yeah yeah so I think it's probably building on um, a lady's question there in terms of um, the multitude of work that people have um, seeing insight as more nice to have and something I need to do rather than it needs to be an integral part of starting almost a process. So what is that consumer insight that therefore starts the process of how I do my planning, strategies, etc. So I think that was the key aspect is um, making sure that we developed um, things within their usual operating model that made sense. So bringing that to life more, um, but also having easy ways for them to get to consumers. So things like the learning cafes, something really 
ad hoc, simple, during a coffee break, half an hour, sit down, listen to a thought-provoking piece of work from an agency partner. Last question. Uh, Eli from Brainstork. So you said that you are planning to conduct in-home uh, conversations in the next year. Have you considered uh, online alternatives to perform this because uh, people are already at their homes when they use online methodologies and yeah. they are in the safety of their homes, they can show around and this can bring also an agile approach to you. So have you considered this? And the other question, you said you had live conversations with 20 uh, consumers so far. So are you planning to increase it and what would be the uh, optimum number? Like 200, 2000 maybe? Maybe it's a yeah. dream, but... I'll start with the second one. So that was just as part of Lighthouse. So bearing in mind that was six days. So over the course of six days, we had 20 live consumer focus groups, or 20 people in live consumer focus groups. We've had multitudes of conversations with consumers across the sort of like 66 different product projects we've done. So it's not just that. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't even count how many consumers we've spoken to, but it, it's a vast number. Um, and your first question, sorry, remind me again. I've got baby brain. I have. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so it'll definitely still be a combination for us because, I mean, one aspect that we've discovered through the pandemic is online is cheaper. So as a company, in terms of our budget and how we stretch it, it is cheaper. Um, we are, I mean, as part of a sort of... Um, relationship with agencies. We, we want to challenge them in terms of what are the new methodologies we can think about um, and balance, make sure that we have that face time value with consumers in their house, but also that balance of budget versus um, what are we trying to get out of the project. So that for me is key in terms of our agency relationships is making sure that any options that they come back to us whether it be new options in the post-pandemic world, what can that offer us? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Karen. You. It's been really interesting. Um, I love the all of the speakers' transparency and and maybe explaining things in a very candid and open way. And one thing stands out. Um, 30 years ago, it was already a job to organize, perform, and present the research studies. Um, what I'm seeing is that there's another job on top of the first one to nurture them, democratize them, keep them alive, uh, spread the news, and, 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 and maintain uh, the, the level of knowledge. So I really am impressed by how you guys out there and in the three presentations are really going to lens in order to you know, show people what you've been doing while instead of waiting for people to, to come and ask at the source of knowledge, which was maybe the case 30 years ago. Okay, So really kudos to you for that. And uh, um, let's have a break now and we'll be back in about a half an hour for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>